Hey everyone, thank you as always for checking in. YouTube has now introduced a light up button when I ask you to subscribe and like. If you have watched one or more of my videos and like my content, please subscribe and like and watch those buttons light up. And also you are helping my channel at the same time. Last thing that I want to say to those who have, thank you and thank you to my new YouTube members and especially to my Patreons who support me also and those of you that have bought coffee for me. Today our case brings us to a place we call in Ireland the sunny southeast and to the town of Wexford in County Wexford. County Wexford is home to many beautiful beaches along the east coast and is a very popular destination for staycations. There are many beautiful hotels, Airbnbs here and options to stay in mobile homes and caravans which are mostly owned by the Irish here and it is one of the places where they flock to if there's a glimmer of sunshine. Here in the heart of the town live Rebecca French and her two daughters, Tia 10 and Kaya 5. They live together at Mount Prospect, but Rebecca's family came from the area known as Madeline Town, nearer to the coast. Rebecca came from a family of nine siblings and was the baby of the family. Her father was a former lightship employee, a fisherman and a man who built his own boats. He passed away in 2002. Her mother Nancy was a stay-at-home mammy. Sure, with nine children, I'm sure she hadn't the time for anything else. Rebecca, being the youngest of the family, was affectionately indulged throughout her childhood by her sisters and brothers, the eldest being 22 years old before she came along. They bought her clothes and took her along to the roller discos in the parish hall before any of her peer group were allowed to go. From the age of eight, Rebecca was dressing up to take part in miming competitions in the former Dolphin Bar. I guess it's what we call nowadays lip-syncing competitions. When the American singing duo Criss Cross were at the height of their fame in the early 90s, Rebecca was a big fan, even wearing her jeans back to front for one of her competitions, said her mother. Her mother would also tell reporters how beautiful Rebecca was as a baby winning a Farley's baby competition at nine months. Rebecca was also into her fashion and makeup and hairstyling and even did a beauty course at Enniscorthy Vocational College in 2008. She wanted to be a freelance beautician and hairstylist, working her own hours to bring in money, but also being there for her two girls. She was slowly but surely gathering all the equipment she needed. Her speciality was sewn in hair extensions, which she did for family and friends. Her skill there was self-taught. Rebecca also loved reggae music, especially Bob Marley. And according to her mother Nancy, one of the reasons for her decision to move to London at the age of 17 was to meet Ziggy Marley. Before moving to London to study special needs childcare, Rebecca went to school at Faith Primary School and then went to Wexford Vocational College. When she came home from London, she had her first child and returned to London shortly afterwards. But when her daughter was two years old, she would return to Wexford for good and eventually end up living in Mount Prospect in 2007. By then, she had her second child, Kaya. So by 2009, Rebecca was well settled into her life. The two girls were going to school locally and Rebecca was living where she had all her family and friends around her and she was building her business and life was pretty good. On Thursday the 8th of October 2009, 30-year-old Rebecca went out for a few drinks with friends, leaving her two girls with family. The two girls were dropped at their school the next morning. The family became concerned when they hadn't heard from Rebecca throughout the Friday morning, and when they heard that evening that a body was found and a rest being made at a house in Ardnadara Estate, and Rebecca not being one of the arrested, their concern grew even more, as they knew she had been out the night before with these people, and she had often been to this house in the past. What happened to Rebecca after this would shock Wexford and Ireland to its core. On this day, at around 4.30pm, several people travelling through the Ferry Carrick area, which is on the outskirts of town, phoned the Gardaí to tell them there was a car on fire in Cods Lane close to the New Ross roundabout at the Maldron Hotel. 
Gardaí were on the scene in minutes and immediately opened the doors of the car to try and help anyone who might be trapped inside, but no one was found. They opened the boot also, but all they could see were flames bellowing out and what looked like a blanket on fire. It was evident that this was where the fire originated and that an accelerant had been used to start the fire. When the fire brigade arrived, the fire was quickly put out. The car hadn't been long on fire and the guardie could tell it was a blue 1998 Opel Corsa. Once the fire was out, the emergency services moved in to have a closer look at the car. It was then they made the horrific discovery in the boot. It wasn't just a blanket that had been on fire, but a body. It was a body of a woman. The car and the surrounding area were immediately sealed off. A forensic team arrived from Dublin along with the state pathologist Mary Casty. Gardaí that had been responding to the fire that evening came upon four men walking in the area. The Gardaí had stopped to do a cursory check with the four men who were not acting suspiciously. They were walking and not running but some of the men were well known to the Gardaí. They told the Gardaí that they were just walking back from a friend's house and heading to Ardnadara Estate off the Clonard Road. One of these men was Patrick O'Connor who owned a house there and it was not far from where the burnt out car was found. It just so happened that an hour later other Gardaí called to Patrick's house to issue a summons for an unrelated matter to someone that shared the house with him. When they knocked on the door there was no answer at first. The blinds were down on the windows and smoke was coming from the chimney of the house. When they knocked again, a man answered and Gardy entered the house. Inside were four men and one woman. Two of the men were sitting on a couch in the living room with no trousers or shoes on. The Garda noted that the washing machine was running and the basket next to the machine had what they thought to be bloodstained clothing. In a press in the kitchen, they found a box of latex gloves cable ties and rubber gloves. In the fireplace there were burnt remnants of what looked like cable ties and rubber gloves along with women's jewellery. One of the chairs in the living room had its covers removed and they too were found in the washing basket. Later that evening as word got around about the car being found on fire and the body in the boot people began to speculate who it was. While locals grappled with this, they thought it may be gang related and that the car had been dumped there by Dubliners. It wouldn't be the first time for this to be the case. But soon the word on the street was that in fact it was someone local and that it was Rebecca who had been murdered and found in the boot of her car. The official identification would not come until Sunday evening when through dental records it would indeed be confirmed that it was poor Rebecca. That evening, the Gardaí would call again to Patrick O'Connor's house at number 17, Ardnadara, and arrest the four men, including O'Connor, and two women in relation to Rebecca's death. The house was sealed off for forensic examination. The Gardaí and neighbours were well aware of the comings and goings at number 17. Different cars would be constantly there at all hours of the night, and there were what seemed to be house parties quite often. On Saturday evening, Rebecca's preliminary post-mortem was completed by the state pathologist Mary Casty. It was revealed that Rebecca had been the victim of a violent assault and had suffered serious and extensive injuries, which resulted in her death. With this news, the Gardaí felt that Rebecca may have been assaulted at the house in Ardnadara, put in the boot of her car and driven to Cods Lane, where the car was set alight. That weekend, nearly a hundred Gardaí were called in to help with the investigation, including members of the Crime Scene Technical Bureau and the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation. At this point of the investigation, the last known sight of Rebecca was that Friday morning at 11am. Door-to-door inquiries were conducted and statements were taken. Garda checkpoints were set up near Cods Lane. By Sunday, the two women in their 20s that had been arrested were released without charge. One of the women was a local, while the other woman lived locally, but was a foreign national. On that same Sunday evening, two men appeared before Judge Donica O'Buckle at a special sitting of Wexford District Court. They were Lithuanians Ricardo Stilius, aged 27, and Ruslanas Manikas, aged 25, 
both with an address at Davit Road South in Wexford. They were both charged with Rebecca's murder and remanded into custody at Clover Hill Prison to appear again the following Friday at Clover Hill District Court in Dublin. Polish man Peter Pasiak, aged 26, of Lower John Street, Wexford, was also brought before the court on Sunday evening, charged with intent to impede the apprehension or prosecution of a person who had murdered Rebecca at No. 17 Ardnadara on the previous Friday, the 9th of October. He was also remanded to Cloverhill Prison until his court appearance the following Friday. On Monday morning at 10.30am, Wexford man Patrick O'Connor, aged 40, appeared at the regular sitting of Wexford District Court and was also charged with intent to impede the apprehension or prosecution of a person who had murdered Rebecca at his house. Of course, all four were granted free legal aid because not one of them had a job between them. No surprise there then. Except for O'Connor, whose family were building contractors, JPK Developments, and built the house O'Connor was living in. And I guess they employed him, but with all their money, he still managed to get free legal aid. O'Connor was also remanded at Cloverhill Prison to appear in court again the following Friday. All four accused covered their faces as they were brought to and from the court, where TV and newspaper crews were waiting for their arrival on Sunday evening and Monday morning. During this time, many articles were published by newspapers, deeming Rebecca as being involved with drugs and living a risky lifestyle, which forced the family to release their own statement to clear her name. They said that it was untrue and inaccurate that Rebecca was involved in any illegal drugs. She was a loving mother, a wonderful sister and a very considerate daughter. Quote, a lot of things written in the newspapers were wrong. It was all false. It made her out to be something she wasn't. Rebecca loved life. She loved music and dancing. She would turn up the radio in the kitchen and dance around with her two girls. On Monday evening, the 12th of October, Rebecca's body was released for burial. The family took the two little girls to say their last goodbyes to their mother. The children put a photograph of Rebecca on the casket, along with a little box of mementos of their mother. Rebecca's brother George bought a star on the internet on the Sunday night in memory of his sister. It is now called Princess Rebecca. In future years the girls will be able to look at it and think about her, he said. The following evening a stunned silence descended on the streets of Wexford as the funeral cortege made its way to Bride Street Church. Rebecca's funeral took place the next day. Hundreds of mourners turned out once again to support her little girls her mother Nancy and her brothers and sisters. Rebecca was then buried at Crosstown Cemetery. The following Friday, the four men appeared in court once more and were remanded in custody at Clover Hill for a further four weeks. Meanwhile, the Gardaí appealed to the public for any information they might have in relation to Rebecca's movements on the Friday before she was found dead in her burnt-out car. Also, they appealed for information on the four men arrested. In December 2009, the books of evidence were served to the DPP. By January 2010, a fifth person was charged in relation to Rebecca's death. 25-year-old Helen Connors of Belvedere Road. She appeared at Waterford District Court, charged with impeding the apprehension and or prosecution of persons believed to be responsible for Rebecca's murder. When the charge was put to her in the guard station, Helen Connors told the Gardaí, quote, I was in fear for my life, four hardy men asking me if I wanted a bullet in my head. Gardaí objected to bail as she had a history of not turning up to court, that it was a very serious charge and she had connections in England, therefore a flight risk. Helen's solicitor put forward that she had a young child and was residing with her mother since her first arrest and had known from this time that she may be charged with something and still she stayed, not only in Ireland but Wexford. Helen didn't have a passport either and said she was willing to comply with any conditions set. The solicitor also explained away her past missed court dates, saying at the time she had a serious drug problem which she had since overcome. 
Judge Donica O'Burkel remanded Helen in custody and said he would review his decision in a week's time when more information came in on how involved Helen was in Rebecca's death. However, bail was denied the following week. Gardy told the judge that Helen had not been informed that she would be facing charges in the following months and therefore she did not stick around out of the goodness of her heart and would have most likely fled if she thought she'd be charged. The judge was also told that the books of evidence were just ready and would be available in the next number of weeks. By the 22nd of February the books were served and Helen was remanded in continuous custody but with consent to go to the High Court to appeal for bail. She did not do this and remained behind bars until her trial. On the 5th of October 2010, the four men appeared at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin and straight away the defence put forward an application before the jury, were sworn in, and court was adjourned for the judge to look over this application and decide on the matter. Two days later the trial began again, but with only two defendants this time those that were charged with the murder of Rebecca. Both men pleaded not guilty. As for the other two men, Patrick O'Connor and Peter Pasiak, who were charged with impeding the Gardaí's investigation, had pleaded guilty and therefore did not appear in court with the other two charged with murder. They just had to wait to be sentenced now. It was the prosecution's case that it was Ricardo Stilius and Roslanas Manikas who were in court with interpreters had assaulted Rebecca. They had kicked and stamped on her and beat her with golf clubs. The prosecution put to the court that the two had acted jointly in inflicting the injuries on Rebecca. The first witness to take to the stand was a woman that worked in a local shop in the town. She described how she had been working on the morning of Friday the 9th of October 2009 when two women came into the shop. One had approached the checkout while the other went to the back of the shop. The woman at the checkout described how the woman seemed a little out of it but couldn't smell drink from her. This woman would later be identified as Rebecca. After the two women had left, she realised that a bottle of wine was missing. The next woman on the stand worked in the local Aldi and was working there the morning of Rebecca's death. She knew Rebecca personally as the two had worked together previously. She said at around 10am Rebecca and a woman had come into the shop and Rebecca stood in a queue to pay for breakfast items while the other woman walked around. As the two women went to leave together the witness noticed the other woman had a plastic bag around her wrist which wasn't there before and seemed to have something in it. She stopped the two women before they got a chance to leave. She said the other woman seemed disorientated had two black eyes and spoke very quickly. The witness examined the bag this woman was carrying and in it was a bottle of rum. Poor Rebecca was mortified and offered to pay for it, but the witness couldn't sell her the alcohol due to the time of day. Here in Ireland, alcohol by law cannot be sold until 10.30am on weekdays and 12.30pm on Sundays. Another woman who knew Rebecca also testified. She said she was driving on the morning of Friday the 9th of October when an oncoming car swerved to her side of the road, almost crashing into her. She was very surprised when she realised it was Rebecca's car and she was the one driving. She said Rebecca looked wild-eyed and she wasn't sure if it was because of the near crash or was she on something. The defence put it to this woman, quote, that it wasn't unusual for Rebecca to be intoxicated. This woman reluctantly agreed and became visibly upset at the admission. Then witnesses concerning the men were brought to the stand to testify that they had seen the four men close by to Rebecca's car at the time it was found on fire. Gardaí, firemen and emergency responders also gave testimony on what was seen that Friday afternoon after responding to the call-out. The state pathologist Dr Mary Cassidy reported to the jury that she had been called out the morning after the discovery of Rebecca's body in the boot of the burnt-out car. She described how a blue plastic bag had been tied around Rebecca's head and was secured with a cable tie, and there were other cable ties around her wrist. A petrol can was also seen nearby. Rebecca's body had not been totally burnt by the fire, 
and bruising could be seen on her face and body. Rebecca had suffered broken ribs and the bruising on her stomach and chest was consistent with kicking and stamping. There was no smoke or soot in Rebecca's lungs and therefore it was concluded that she was dead before the fire was started. Rebecca's cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Dr. Mary Cassidy did say though that the blue bag was secured so tightly around Rebecca's neck that it left marks on her neck and she could have suffocated but in her opinion it was put on to catch the blood coming from her head. A neighbour that lived two doors down from 17 Ardnadara testified that there was always lots of comings and goings at the house. He said on the morning of Friday the 9th of October 2009 he had seen two women in a blue Corsa car driving out of the estate at around 9am. He then saw it leaving again later on, this time with a man and a woman in it. He said whoever was in it was driving erratically. He said he thought that there was something wrong with the car, the driver was drunk or it was someone learning to drive. That evening he saw four men walking back to the estate and there was no sign of the car. He thought it odd as one of the four men was the driver he had seen earlier. The next two days were spent in legal arguments and when open court resumed again, just as Barry White explained to the jury, it was because of a complex new legislation which required dealing with. Forensics from the house were then brought forward. Blood had been found on golf clubs that had been found in a coat stand at the house in Ardnodara. More blood was found in the living room and the patio slabs at the back of the house. All this blood tested positive to being Rebecca's. Photographs of the house were also shown to the jury where Rebecca had spent time there drinking with the two accused and several other people. After about a week into the trial, it would be turned on its head in true form to the Irish justice system. When the jury arrived in the morning, just as Barry White told them that they were being discharged, that the trial was over. The DPP had withdrawn the murder charges against the two men. The legal arguments that had taken place the week before concerned whether or not the statements taken from the two accused while in custody were admissible or not, due to the circumstances of their detention in the Garda station. Judge Barry White ruled that they would not be presented in court as the detention had been unlawful. It emerged that after the men were arrested and brought to the Garda station in Wexford, questioning was suspended after Gardaí had requested that the men be seen by a doctor, as it was clear they had consumed alcohol. A local GP came to the station and examined both of them, confirming they were unfit to be questioned. But the doctor had not specified a period of time to when the Gardaí could resume questioning. The new legislation which had been introduced the year before was implemented and at 11.45 that night questioning resumed even though the time allowed for the initial period of detention of the men expired. Mr Justice Barry White therefore ruled quote, the interview suspension period as certified by a doctor could not exceed six hours. This ruling had the effect that anything told to the guardee after the men's detention lapsed, that being at 11.45pm, could not be used as evidence, as it was done in a period of time of unlawful detention, though the DPP decided not to continue their prosecution against the two men for murder. They had pleaded guilty to disposing of Rebecca's body and impeding the guard investigation. Justice Barry White then spoke to the jury, that he would not be passing any comment on the evidence and said that members of the jury would form their own opinions and conclusions. Rebecca's family were devastated on hearing this decision and they all broke down in tears. The eight-day trial was all but over and no one was going to be held accountable for Rebecca's murder. In the wake of the collapse of the trial, the French family made no statement to the press. They wanted to wait for sentencing and boy would they have their say. In October 2010, it was revealed that Ruslanis Manikas had been in court on the 5th of October 2009, four days before he killed Rebecca. He was charged with threatening an ambulance crew. This related to two incidents, the first occurring on the 14th of August of that same year, 
when an ambulance had come to Manikas's aid, but he had been too aggressive and instead was arrested. Then, a month later, Gardy had responded to an incident in Wexford town. Manikas and another man were intoxicated and tried to flee when the Gardy arrived. When Gardy caught up with him, he was aggressive and again he was arrested. At this court hearing, he was given bail on the condition he'd stay out of trouble, keep the peace, and the judge was told that Manikas was being treated by doctors at the local mental health facility. The court was also told that he was suffering from a terminal illness and as a result had severe mental health issues which led to his abuse of alcohol and he had tried to take his own life in the past. Four days later though he would take Rebecca's life in the most violent and heinous way imaginable. Patrick O'Connor was also out on bail at the time Rebecca was murdered for possession of a shotgun and facing charges over a violent break-in at a house. On the morning of the 30th of November 2010, the court resumed for sentencing. Rachel French, Rebecca's sister, stood up to give her victim impact statement before the judge passed sentencing. What she had to say would have a sudden and dramatic impact in the courtroom. Rachel basically let rip on the justice system and the people who savagely murdered her sister. She told the court that Rebecca did not get justice. She called the accused in the case animals, where I would have called them monsters. She continued, quote, Most other countries in a civilised world would not take this justice, that we as a nation seem to suffer at the hands of our legal system. Rachel went on to criticise the decision made by Justice Barry White to his face that the statements made by the two men charged with Rebecca's murder could not be presented in the court, despite what Gardy had done, as Rachel described as, quote, fantastic work during the investigation. Rachel asked for a system to be put in place to prevent people with previous convictions to be allowed to move to Ireland, referring to the fact that the two defendants had previous convictions from their own country in Lithuania. Well, this victim impact statement went down like a lead balloon. While the family were entitled to be angry, they had crossed a line and therefore prejudicial, said Justice Barry White. Now that he had heard about previous convictions concerning the two men, he couldn't unhear it. It might call into question the sentencing he was about to pass to the two men. The victim impact statement might also be used in any appeal by the defendants. The judge felt that he needed to consult with the DPP before he could go any further and whether he should remove himself from the case was also in question. The judge acknowledged the grief and suffering of the French family but also said that it was his opinion that the statement read in court was inappropriate, xenophobic and either lacked an understanding of legal concepts of presumption of innocence joint enterprise and judicial function, or the French family had contempt for them. The DPP decided that Judge Barry White could continue in the case, that no jury could think that the judge was swayed by the victim impact statement. On the 10th of December 2010, sentencing was handed down. The two men who had the murder charges dropped, Dilius and Manikas, appeared alongside O'Connor and Pasiak. Justice Barry White had a few choice words for the men. He described their actions as despicable and that there was very little to distinguish the actions of the four men. In his opinion, the maximum sentence of 10 years was not nearly enough for them and while they enjoyed the presumption of innocence, one or more of them were responsible for the savage and brutal murder of Rebecca. None of the accused showed any remorse although Gardy had said Manikas had told Gardy that he was sick with guilt for what happened to Rebecca. Justice Barry White also said with regret he had to take into consideration their guilty pleas and therefore it affected the length of time he could hand down. The maximum sentence of 10 years was handed down to Manikas, Dilius and O'Connor with the last two years suspended. These sentences would also be backdated. Pasiak was also sentenced to 10 years, with the last two and a half years suspended, because he had no previous convictions. 
the suspended sentences were conditioned to once they got out, they would immediately return to their own countries. The French family said after the collapse of the trial, they had to adjust their expectations. And so they said they were happy all four got the maximum sentence. So you may be wondering what happened in the case of Helen Connors and her charges. On the 4th of June 2011, she appeared at the Central Criminal Court in Dublin. Eight men and four women were sworn in as the jury. Mr Justice Gareth Sheehan presided over the trial. The prosecution told how Helen had disposed and destroyed evidence with the intent to impede the prosecution of the four men. Statements that Helen had given to the Gardaí of what happened that day were read out. She told Gardaí that the four men, Rebecca and herself, were drinking at the house in Ardnadara that Thursday night into Friday. Helen alleged that an argument broke out between Rebecca and Dilius, and he had punched Rebecca several times in the face. Rebecca threatened Dilius with the Gardaí, and with this he became more aggressive and threatening. He called to the other men to go into the kitchen with him. Helen overheard one of the men call Rebecca a rat and talking urgently about gloves. When the men returned from the kitchen, all four of them were wearing white latex gloves. How terrifying. It was then a further attack on Rebecca took place. Dilius kicked Rebecca in the face and she tried to get up and make a run for it to the door but she was not able to get away. It was then they dragged her back in and all four men attacked Rebecca. They took turns hitting her with the golf clubs, kicking and stamping on her body. O'Connor also sprayed CS gas on Rebecca's face to subdue her even more. When they were finished with Rebecca and they had killed her, these monsters went about clean up and Helen was recruited to help. O'Connor went into the next room and lit a fire in the fireplace and they all proceeded to throw their blood-soaked gloves in the fire. O'Connor told the men he knew where he could get rid of the body, that there was a river nearby. While they were gone, Helen was instructed to clean the house and get rid of any evidence in relation to Rebecca and what they had done. Helen told Gardy that she was in fear of her life while Rebecca was being beaten to death and afterwards. She was sure that if she didn't do what she was told, that she too would be killed. She also said she was scared to leave the house when the men were gone because they could return at any time and if they caught her leaving, she feared she too would be killed. Forensics showed that blood found on Helen's clothes had belonged to Rebecca, which is understandable as she was in the room when Rebecca was bludgeoned to death. Ballistics had found 37 locations of blood in the house on furniture, walls, floors and clothing. Some of the clothing had been found in the utility room in a basket next to the washing machine. On Thursday the 9th of June, after four hours of deliberation, the judge said he would accept a majority verdict. That afternoon the jury returned and told the judge that they were unable to reach a verdict. The jury was hung. The judge put in the case for a mention for later that month and Helen was remanded back into custody. On Monday the 27th of June, a retrial was ordered in the case. In February 2012, Pasiak brought his appeal against the severity of his sentencing, saying that Justice Barry White was unduly influenced by the manner Rebecca's body had been disposed of. This appeal was rejected with notes saying, quote, This was a very grave crime and the sentence was appropriate. On the 12th of June 2012, Helen Connors went on trial for a second time. A jury of nine men and three women were sworn in and Justice Paul Carney presided over the trial. The same witnesses attended the trial as the last one. The only thing that was added was a statement by Helen that she was forced by the throat and held by two of the men and made kick Rebecca. Quote, God forgive me, I didn't want to do it. I was forced to kick her. They held me while I kicked her. In my own mind, I thought I'd be killed. It was a do or die situation. Helen was so fearful that she asked Gardy to be moved to another town or another country. In closing arguments, it was brought to the attention of the jury that if Helen was in such fear for her life, she could have fled the house during the 30 minutes the men were gone. 
The jury retired and it took just over an hour to reach a verdict. It was a unanimous verdict. Helen was found not guilty of impeding the investigation into her friend Rebecca's murder. After the sentencing of the four men, the Guardian announced they would not be investigating Rebecca's case any further. This means that no one will ever be convicted of Rebecca's murder. Absolutely no justice was served here and it's deplorable that these savages got away with what they did to poor Rebecca. Patrick O'Connor was released from prison on the 8th of October 2015, the day before what would be the 6th anniversary of Rebecca's death. He did apologise for his part in disposing of her body and that he was sorry he was unable to stop her being killed. I wouldn't believe a word of it. He did not return to Wexford, but in 2016 it was said he was living in Washford. The other three left Ireland upon their release. Along with shock and disbelief comes the need to understand why and how. How could someone do this and why did no one stop it? Our instinct is to try to understand in the hope of lessening fear. We latch on to reports about a frenzied row that got out of hand, prompting us to blame drugs and alcohol. Rebecca's mother, Nancy, spoke about her daughter and said she did not want to think about the people responsible for her death. She said she was very grateful for the kindness and support of the Gardaí and their neighbours and friends in coping with their shock and grief. No answer or understanding came and it will be a long time before the French family and others involved in dealing with Rebecca's death can erase the awful imaging of what happened at that house in Ardnadara Estate from their minds. Rest in peace, Rebecca.